Chaplain Wallace A. Jackson IV is a major in the United States Army. He is the Sustainment Brigade Chaplain, 1st Armored Division, Fort Bliss, Texas. Chaplain Jackson is a native of Louisiana and earned his Bachelor of Arts in Religion from Louisiana College, Pineville, Louisiana in 2003. In 2007, he graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary with a THM and then received his direct commission as an Army Chaplain in 2008. He is also a graduate of Airborne School 2007. By the way, I know some of these details just from talking with him personally. He's made over 50 jumps. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. He's made over 50 jumps from airplanes. I've made 50 jumps off the side of my bed, and that's about it. <laughs> but uh, he graduated from Ranger School. And if you don't know what that is, uh, it's like Army, it's like Navy SEALs, it's, anyway, it's too much to explain right now. Uh, but he graduated from Ranger School in 2013, and then the Chaplain Office Basic Course in 2007, and the Chaplain Captain Career Course in 2015. His previous assignments include 88th Brigade Support Battalion, Fort Polk, Louisiana, 10th Mountain Division, uh, 2 through 30th Infra Infantry Battalion, Fort Polk, Louisiana, with one combat tour to Afghanistan in uh, 2010 to 2011, 82nd Airborne Division, uh, 1 through 325 Airborne Infantry Battalion, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Airborne Ranger Training Brigade, Brigade Camp Merrill, Dahlonega, Georgia, 82nd Airborne Division, 2nd Brigade Combat Team with one combat tour to Iraq in 2017, 1st Armored Division Sustainment Brigade with a combat tour to Afghanistan. That's his second tour to Afghanistan, so three in total. Chaplain Jackson is currently married for 19 years to Amanda Sue, who is a native of Pineville, Louisiana. They currently have six beautiful children, Taylor 16, Wallace the fifth 14, Josiah 12, Andrew 8, Elisha 6, and Grace 4. Please join me this morning in welcoming Major Wallace Jackson to chapel today. Well, thank you so much. This is truly a, a, a quite a blessing and, and a privilege to be here with you today. Um, I do have a quick question, though, uh, in reference to the face mask here. It said Georgia. We, we, that's unauthorized. This is Texas, right? <laughs> we say that when it comes to when you're in the wrong uniform, you, you can be checked on that. You're, in, you're unauthorized. <laughs> no. It's been an absolute privilege and honor to be here with you. And... Um, I first and foremost just want to give thanks to God because, man, God is awesome and He's real and He's alive and He's moving and His love is wider and deeper than we could ever imagine. Um, and we'll learn it as we go on in life more and more and more. Um, I want to give thanks to, to the folks here to give me this opportunity. I want to thank, uh, uh, again, ultimately the Lord uh, for, for bringing me to this point. This is a, a pretty significant time for me. I haven't been here for 15 years. And I was in this uh, auditorium here for orientation back in 2007. And uh, the individual, I believe, if I, my memory serves me correctly, it was Mr. Greg Hattieberg that stood up in front of us, kind of like I'm standing here before you now. And he has an audience of folks that are thinking about coming to Dallas Theological Seminary, right? And, uh, and, and I came here not knowing any little to nothing about DTS, honestly, but just trusted a friend who said, good school, go check it out. Okay, I don't have to think much, I just go, right? It's kind of like jumping out of a plane. <laughs> so I'm pretty good at that. So anyway, uh, I, I, I'm, st I'm, st I'm sitting in the same seats as you are, and, and Greg Hatterberg, first thing that came out of his mouth was, a lot of you come here because you've heard of those that have come before you the Chuck Swindolls, the Tony Evans, right? The Howard Hendricks. And you want to be the next Howard Hendricks and, and, and Tony Evans and, and, 
And he said, they're stars and you have stars in your eyes. He said, don't come. That's not, that's not what we're here about. We're here about servant leadership. It's not about you being the next star. And I said, okay, I got it. That's what I needed to hear. And that was hook, line, and sinker for me. And I ended up at DTS. And then when I got here, I realized, holy cow, I'm a fish out of water. And uh, how fast can I get out of here? How can I break away from the THM and do something a little bit smaller? And can I get an amen? Okay. Uh, I have a feeling we're connecting here just a little bit. Uh, but remember the purpose of chapel, right? Why we are here today. It's, it's in the chapel purpose online. The purpose, again, is to encourage, to find rest, relief, and renewal. That's why we're here today. That's why I'm here. And I want to encourage you. And I hope and, and have prayed and believe that God is going to give us just, a, just a, 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 an injection of rest and relief and renewal, as he always does because he's faithful. And so I've been told that I have about 20 or 30 minutes to do that. But what's cool about it is that I can actually go over that because I'm not being graded. <laughs> because I can remember having five or 10 points off because I went over my time. Dr. Malfers, I believe, was the one grading. I think he's uh, long since he's, he's, he's moved on. But today I want to talk to you about if there was a subject statement, this would be it. I want to talk to you about soldiers for Christ. It's very simple. Soldiers for Christ proclaiming the sacrifice of the full payment. Soldiers for Christ proclaiming the sacrifice of the full payment. It's important to know what a soldier is, right? This is not deep or profound, but when we look at Scripture, we understand that this definition comes from the time, right? Within the first century, maybe a Roman soldier and what they, what they are to do, how they are trained, what is expected of them. A soldier is an individual who is disciplined, who is committed unto death. And if he ever leaves his post, he will face death. So to be a soldier is serious business. It's commitment. It's being in line. So just keep that in mind as we're going through this today. A couple of scriptures I want to share to set the conditions for the message comes from 2 Timothy 2.3. And I'm just going to quote a couple of verses here. This is not necessarily a deep, in-depth, exegetical sermon or message, but a couple of verses I think are important. 2 Timothy 2.3 says this, Share in suffering, as Paul is, ta uh, Paul is talking to Timothy, he says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So there we go. It's this idea of being committed. A soldier... Standing your post, not leaving, relied upon, discipline. And then 1 Corinthians is very important. 9.25, it reads this. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. So they do it to obtain a perishable wreath. It's a wreath that perishes and they give their life for it. But we and an imperishable one. Amen. So today I want to share with you my journey as a chaplain, as a husband, as a father, mostly speaking as a chaplain today, as a Christian chaplain in the United States Army. Basically what I do, very concisely stated, is this. I either provide or I perform religious support in a pluralistic environment. So I don't have to, prov I don't have to perform everything if it's something being asked of me that's not within the tenets of my faith. So I find someone to do that, another chaplain. Right? Or another individual that is contracted or hired to do that. And so that's what I do. That's what I have been doing for the last 15 years, only by the grace of God. There are three areas in my journey that I want to focus on. The first area is training as a chaplain, as a soldier. I'm going to just dive into that bucket a little bit for you and bring out of some of those experiences that I've had in training as a chaplain in the Army. And then I want to talk about combat a little bit, just a couple of moments in combat that I have uh, that, that I have that I'd like to share with you today and then the third bucket might be just some circumstances while being a chaplain in the military so first let's talk about training as a chaplain well first we must not forget that our training starts well much before the career or the ministry maybe you could say it's really starting here or it started before DTS but there's training now so can I share with you some combat like experiences while at DTS training. So I can remember showing up on campus as a new student, not raised in the church, heard David and Goliath for the first time in college while I was getting my bachelor's, 
coming to seminary, sitting in these chairs while in a Trinitarian class and having this great discussion or listening and witnessing a great discussion between a bunch of very intelligent and sharp students with a very smart and experienced professor having this great debate about the Trinity. And I'm saying, what is the Trinity? True story. And I can remember the professor saying very specifically that it is not Christian to not believe in the Trinity. And I thought, well, crap, am I a Christian? <laughs> Maybe I'm not. I've never dealt with this Trinity thing. I've heard Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but I'm not 100% sure. And so I raised my hand. And I said, sir, I'm just going to roll the dice here. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the Trinity. By the way, if anybody understands it completely, please come tell me afterwards. But I said, I'm not really sure about the Trinity. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but I think I'm a Christian. <laughs> and he said very wisely, it's a difference between ignorance and denial. Okay, I'm just ignorant. I need to learn. Teach me. I'm all ears. And so there's my experience in Dallas Theological Seminary. And I can remember being in Hebrew class with Dr. Chisholm. I believe he's still here. Dr. Chisholm. We called him the chisel. <laughs> right? True story. Now, he claimed that he was the more gentler, kindler Dr. Chisholm during my time. But anyway, he was a great guy. He really was. But he was hard. He was tough. And he was real. And he was honest. But he was easygoing. And he was very gracious. And I'm thankful for, for him. I can remember being in that class and being overwhelmed by the exegetical paper that was due. And I'm a procrastinator, I don't know about you, but I would late to the last minute to get a, an assignment done at times and it really hurt me. And I can remember the day before the assignment was due, struggling in the library, sitting at the table with about 15 books open. Anybody been there? Trying to figure out what to do. And I'm just trying to sign my name on the paper, right? But I was struggling and I was overwhelmed and I had enough and this was a buildup and I was really, really uh, uh, under the gun here and I said, you know what? THM is not for me. I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I don't even know why I came to DTS because I am surely a fish out of water. Why am I here? This is too hard. I've made a mistake. I've missed my calling. I've assumed that I need to be here. Well, anyway, as I literally got up and I promise you, when I say I quit, I quit. Because I'm an all-in kind of guy. I'm going to love you to the very death or I'm going to fight you to the very death. And I was quitting seminary that day. And I walked down the steps and I walked out of the front door of the library. And no kidding, you know who was walking right into the library as I was walking out? Was a Hebrew tutor. I cannot remember his name. But he was from Africa. And he was an African student there studying here at DTS. And I said, are you kidding me? I know you're a tutor, and I know you tutor Hebrew. And I said, hey, can I stop you for a second? Yes, brother. I said, can you help me? I have an assignment due tomorrow. I need your help. I'm desperate. And he said, yes, can you come back in a couple of hours, and we'll sit down. And long story short, he helped me get through it. Can anybody relate? <laughs> and so I can remember the 50, 100, 1,000-pound bombs dropped on me as I came here and went through every semester called books thinking, holy cow, I have to read all of this? And I started realizing I don't read very well. How am I supposed to read all of this? Now, I could read Green Eggs and Ham, sure. I read a few books here and there, maybe. But seminary books? Big books like this? Deep, profound, big words that I've never pronounced? So then, the Lord blesses me with, hey, Wallace. He didn't speak. There was no voice. I didn't hear anything, but... Somebody encouraged me during that time and said, you know, we're offering a rapid reading course. That's me. And I signed up for that course and I took that and that transformed my reading and therefore gave me hope and encouragement. So there's my DTS training. And I can remember being overwhelmed by all the classes and all the, the, the thoughts and big definitions and big words, thinking, holy cow, I'm just trying to figure out this, where this David and Goliath story is. And that is a true story. And I can remember a professor saying, and it always stuck with me, he says, this is a lot of stuff. It can be overwhelming. Just remember this. When you go out to do ministry, just love the people. And you think, okay, I can do that. Until you get in ministry and realize, dang, that's like the hardest thing to do. I'd rather do that Hebrew exegetical. People are hard to love, man. But that's what we're called to do. So I'm just thankful for that DTS training. 
Now let me focus a little bit on my army training as a chaplain. Yes, I've been to airborne school and I had the chance to do five jumps and qualify and be airborne qualified. And I only did that, not because I had this great history of chaplain or army or military background and I know what airborne is. I'm the guy that said, what's airborne? Well, chaplain, you'd be good. You should go because you're going to get that badge and that's going to connect you with soldiers, right? And you're going to smell like the sheep, walk like the sheep and talk like the sheep. Therefore, you can lead the sheep. So you need to go to airborne. You'll probably never jump again. It's very rare. There's only a few airborne units. What they failed to tell me is that if you're airborne qualified, you're now unique and you're going straight to the airborne unit and you're probably going to stay there. So I said, okay, I'll do this airborne thing. And I jumped on a plane and I jumped out of the plane five times to qualify. My second jump was horrible. My first jump was great. I thought I could do this all day long. You jump out of an airplane, your chute opens, it's silk, it's quiet, it's peaceful. It's an amazing experience. It's violent, silence, and then violent again because you got to hit the floor. You got to hit the ground, but this was a good landing because the field was tilled. It was soft dirt. And so I had a real nice soft landing. I said, man, I can do this all day. This is me. My second jump made the wrong mistake, took a bad step, jumper error, hit the side of the, the door of the plane, circled out, totally forgot the whole sequence of what I was supposed to do. By the time I got to the ground, I hit the ground awkward. I had a concussion. I couldn't see out of my peripheral. I was seeing stars. I didn't say anything because I'm tough and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do this. But I thought, how the heck am I going to get three, four, and five jump in as a chaplain at the age of 30, 31, whatever age I was? I wasn't, I wasn't a young stud. I wasn't 17, 18, 19 years old. And so I went ahead and continued on, long story short. But I think what a challenge. What a hard thing. Why am I here? I'm a chaplain. I don't need to be in airborne school. Did I miss my call? This is way too hard. This is way beyond me. I don't even know what I'm getting into. Oh, by the way, there's 300 foot towers that they take you up on to help progress you into jumping out of an airplane. I finally discovered I'm scared of heights during that moment. Not a good experience. So I'm thinking, why am I here? And then I have some jumps and years go on and then I'm jumping out of a UH-60, which is a Black Hawk, right? And I push off the side of it and I'm with an MC-6 and it has toggles and you can control it. And we're jumping in North Georgia into a cow pad, into a cow paddy. It was a cow paddy that we landed on, but into a cow pasture in the farm. It was amazing. But one day, jumper era, I realized by the time the wind was blowing in one direction very hard, I was over the trees and didn't have enough time to turn my shoe to get back. So where do you think I landed? In the trees. That's scary. When you realize you're over the top of the trees and I'm not getting back to this, to this field. I'm going to land in these trees. So thankfully I went through the trees and everything was real smooth. They teach you what to do, how to protect your body. It's all natural reaction. It's muscle memory. And so I went ahead and, and did what I had to do, and I came down real nice and easy. But that's scary stuff. And again, I'm thinking, I'm like 36 years old. Why am I jumping out of planes? I can still be a chaplain and do just fine. You see, we're all going to have tree landings in life. We're all going to have these airborne experiences, these DTS experiences, and we're going to wonder, why am I here? This is too hard. Have I missed my calling? And then another jump I had as an airborne paratrooper, which I'm a paratrooper at heart. I'm very proud of that great legacy. And I stand on broad shoulders and the people to my left and right, it's amazing. But it's scary at times. I can remember jumping out of a plane one day and hitting the ground so hard, I thought my back was broken. I thought my, my, I, I broke my hip. I, it was pretty significant pain. And I'm, I feel like I'm a tough person, but when I stood up to walk off the drop zone, because every paratrooper says, hey, if you walk off a drop zone, that's a good jump. So I was focused and determined to walk off of the drop zone. As soon as I started to come up just halfway, intense pain shot through and it brought me to my knees and a medic came over the hill and said, are you okay? And I paused and I said, nope. And I, that was it. They took me off the drop zone, took me to the hospital. Thankfully, because I drank milk when I was a kid, I guess, no broken bones, praise the Lord, but I had a significant pelvic sprain and that took months. It took months to recover from, but I eventually got back. But then again, you're questioning, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? At that time, I might've been about 38 years old and I'm thinking, what the heck am I doing? This is stupid. This doesn't make any sense. This can't be God. Soldiers for Christ, proclaiming the sacrifice of the full payment. That's our focus. That's where we need to stay focused. 
in our life when we're going through these things. And I can remember as a new chaplain, used in a lot of different ways, even on staff, in ways to advise the commander on morale or issues that are going on in the organization. I can remember my first three months on ground as a brand new chaplain to a brand new unit. I didn't know much about the army, but I, I knew somewhat of ministry and loving people, right? So I was there, standing tall. And I remember everybody being called in, all the key leaders in the staff. Not the commander, though. He stayed in his office. We all gathered in a conference room. And they went around, and I had no clue what was going on. I was totally surprised. Just hurry up and get here. We'll, we'll figure it out when you get here. So I sit down at the conference table, and around the whole table, they're asking, Who do you, what do you think about the commander, his leadership? What do you think about the commander and his leadership? And every person around the room said, he's good. We love him. I'd work for him any moment, any time. He's a blessing. He's good to us. And I thought, okay, I'm not discounting that, but they're not telling the full story. Because I remember just a week prior to that, he had crushed somebody in a meeting, absolutely humiliated the person, used a lot of language, a lot of volume, and a lot of things you just wouldn't tell somebody, okay, in a very professional setting. Well, the next time this individual who was scolded for what he had done was shaking in his boots, literally, and scared. And this was a senior captain. So he really, the commander really dug into him. So he comes around the table to me, and I said, I just got to tell the truth here. I got to be honest about what's going on. And I said, I don't disagree with what all y'all are saying. I said, I believe that this is true. I've seen the man. I believe he loves us, but he's got some things going on that's just not right. And I said, I just don't think that's the right attitude or actions of a leader. I was the last person to speak. We all start leaving out. I'm the last person to walk out the room and the the executive officer, who is pretty much the right-hand man to the commander, who takes the staff and brings them in and facilitates all that the mission requires, stops me, closes the door, and it's just the XO and myself, the executive officer and myself. And he says, Chaplain, what you just said, nobody else would say. Now, I need you, I need you to walk down this hall, come with me, and tell the commander what you just said. <laughs> Are you kidding me? How about you go tell him? You're going to throw me under the bus? Because they can utilize the chaplain like that, right? Okay, Lord's in control. So I'm thinking, what is going on in my life? So I walk down the longest hall of my life. I walk into his office. He was kind of like the godfather. The lights were down. He didn't say much. People feared him. He sat down really low in his chair. No lights on in his office. There's a technique to this. So if you go into a professor or somebody's office and you, have, you see the lights are down and they're sitting in with an open window behind them, but you can't see their face or their facial expression. All you see is a silhouette. Walk back out. <laughs> this guy sits, stands about 6'4". He played college football. He was a, a lineman. He was a big man. He was a tanker. He had been to several campaigns overseas. Desert Storm being one of them. He slept under his tank, on top of his tank, rationed water. It was a tough fight for a little while, so this is a tough, hard man. And so I sat down, nervous, but thought, you know what? Let me just go ahead and tell him. Long story short, it ended well, and I was able to pray with him. But it's moments like this you think, what am I doing here? This doesn't make sense. I'm not prepared. I didn't expect this. And here I am being thrown seemingly under the bus. But who's in control of all of it from day one? to eternity. He's in control. And I can remember having to confront another commander in a chapel setting where this commander was acting just a little funny and making jokes and being a bit of a distraction in a worship service. And I said, I have to confront my commander at the end of the service and saying, sir, you can't do that. He was basically making fun of somebody that was worshiping a little bit different than he was. And so he knew after the fact, he knew what I, was ask, what I was asking him to stay behind for. So he knew what was going on. Long story short, he told me, he says, uh, by the way, this is a couple of days later, we're not going to send you to ranger school. We originally were, but we just don't think you're cut out for it. And I thought, I think this might be personal. But then again, you're thinking, what's going on? I'm like, I'm like a, a man on a yo-yo, right? And I'm thinking, what's going on here? But I trust God because I'm not going to go beating down no doors. I'll let him open it in his timing. And so I waited, and I got another opportunity to go, and the rest is history regarding that. And so then I have a couple of combat experiences as, as a chaplain in my journey I'd like to share with you. 
There are many, but here's one. I can remember walking out of a, out of a, 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 a post, a headquarters area where a certain company of infantrymen were, were doing operations out of. They were trying to win the hearts and minds of the local populace. They were fighting the enemy and the bad guys that are out, uh, you know, that are out in the populace and, and taking, always taking RPGs or, or taking, uh, you know, rounds onto the base and small arms fire and machine gun fire all the time. Matter of fact, it's a, it's a running joke that uh, I wasn't allowed to go there because no kidding, every time I landed there, in their compound uh, as I came in on a black hawk on a bird we would get attacked you think chaplain we want you to come no they kept telling me don't come because every time you come they attack us so that day I walked out with this company and I can remember walking just it was it wasn't it wasn't a very aggressive mission it was just to go out and check on a family who had a child had been hurt by an explosive because we're trying to win the hearts and minds, right? So we go out and we talk to the family. We, we try to gather information, right, to, to do the mission. And I can remember walking there. Everything is good. The chaplain's just bebopping. You know, he ain't got a rifle on him. He's non-combatant. He doesn't shoot nobody, right? So I'm just walking, having a good time, jab, jabbing away, talking, talking to people, being a chaplain. It's great. They love me being out there. Hey, chaplain, you come outside the wire with us. That's pretty gutsy. This is cool. Kind of builds their morale a little bit. So we're walking back, and all of a sudden, I see before I hear anything. And it's divots all around me. All, I mean, right there, right here, right here. And I'm like, what is that? And then I hear the popping and the whizzing and the cracking. And that's a machine gun that is zero in on me and several of us that are walking far too close. Number one, we were walking in the wrong route because we walked the same way we walked out. It's called route selection, right? But I learned that as a kid because there were kids in the neighborhood I stayed away from. So I walked down that street and not this street, right? So I should have I applied some of that street knowledge. I found myself getting in the lowest part of the dirt I possibly could immediately. And I have never, I've never to this day had my heart beating so fast and so hard. When you're pinned down by machine gun fire, this is not a pop. This is not a nine mil. This is not one round, a shotgun, a rifle. Did you hear that? This is being pinned down and thinking I could die right now or get hurt really bad. And by the way, the first sergeant that was walking with me, he fell because he got shot in the leg. And he's tough as nails because that joker hobbled off to get, it's amazing what you do when you have a body full of endorphins and, and such. But we made it back. Long story short, I bounded, got out of the kill zone and got back there. And you think again, I'm just a chaplain. Why am I doing this? I have a family at home. I didn't have to walk outside the wire with them. I could have stayed at the base, but I made a decision to be with my men, to be with them. It's tough. There's IDs or big blasts. They put craters in roads to where we couldn't drive our vehicles through and we had to drive around them. This is significant stuff. This is not, it's intimidating to say the least. RPGs shot at your quarter to half a million dollar vehicle. It will go right through that vehicle from one end to the other and shrapnel will hit everybody in the vehicle. Those are real threats and those are real struggles and real events. And you think, this is hard. And you question, should I still do this? Should I be doing this? I'm away from my family again. I could die. Death is real. And I can remember being a Christian, a young believer, saying, I'm ready to die for the gospel. Until I was faced with death. Until I faced it for real. And I said, holy cow, death is real. You better be ready. Soldiers for Christ. Proclaiming the sacrifice of the full payment. And I can remember another circumstance in which I was thinking, God, how can you be in this? This doesn't make any sense. So I'm in Iraq this time. And this was amazing because I'm flying in a helicopter, sometimes by myself in a Black Hawk with the door open and my foot hanging out with a headset talking to the pilots. I don't know nothing about flying a Black Hawk helicopter, but I'm a cool guy today. They're talking to me. I'm the chaplain. I'm talking to them. I'm flying over Mosul, over the Tigris River. That's Nineveh. I'm looking right down with my foot hanging out the helicopter, thinking, what am I? This is crazy. I get to be here and do ministry. Well, anyway, so I'm having this great time, and I had this magnificent Mosul religious support plan. Anybody ever have those magnificent plans in life to do ministry and what it's going to look like? Well, I did, and I thought it was pretty wise and smart. And a matter of fact, I was able to convince my supervisor that it was a good idea and that I should do it right away. 
So I had a plan as we were getting ready to redeploy and go back home to go to a hub so I could receive my soldiers and get the redeployment training done. It was, it was a magnificent plan. I'll go visit some people on my way there. I'll do what a chaplain does and I'll pre, I'll pre stage myself. The, that way we can get the training done and get home faster. Chaplain sounds like a good plan. Go. So this is a big deal. You don't just call Southwest or put your, your book of flight online. This is helicopters and planes and on the ground, and you're trying to get far distances, right? And some of those birds and assets get pulled because they're higher priority missions, a general or something else is going on. It's a medical asset maybe, or soldiers are out in, a, in, a, in combat and they need help. So anyway, so I make, my, I make my way to the destination to do the training almost, and I'm traveling around. And, and I get to one location visiting, and then I get a phone call that says, Chaplain, you need to come back. I said, are you kidding me? I just spent all this time planning, training, uh, pl planning, planning uh, this, this, this ministry, all these flights, and now you're telling me I have to come back. That doesn't make any sense, but as a good soldier, what do I have to do? Okay, if it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical, roger that. So I salute the flag and I'm on my way back. Well, it took me a while to get back. And you think, I've been doing all this stuff and you got me on a yo-yo. And this is not easy stuff. I'm not telling you all the details. I had to hustle. I had to, I had to get on birds. It was dangerous. It was crazy. It was, it was a good plan. I felt good about it. I was tired. I'm ready to go home too, right? So now I've got to come back. God, are you in this? This is too hard. Should I keep doing this? Is this really what you've called me to do? Am I doing it for the money, for the security? For the badges? You question those things. How can you do this? Because I'm a soldier for Christ. 2 Timothy 2.3 Share in suffering as a good soldier. Now we all have our stories. Our levels of suffering. People we've lost. Experiences. And it's all relative to the individual. But that doesn't end. Because let me tell you how God was in control. So I hustled my rear end to get back where I needed to be as a good soldier. And nobody was tracking me. They just said, get back. And that's it, because they're busy fighting the fight. This fight, by the way, give it context, was fighting with Iraq to do away with ISIS because they turned Mosul into a caliphate, planning to take over. And we were assisting the Iraqis who spilled a lot of blood to take back Mosul. So that's the context. So as I'm getting back to my location, I fly in at 2 o'clock in the morning, 02 in the morning. Nobody's there to pick me up, right? And that's fine. And typically they're not. I just, I know where I need to go. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big boy. I can figure it out. And so I had my rucksack, because remember, I had planned to already go. I had all my stuff with me, right? So I'm taking my rucksack, two duffel bags. I got about an extra 150 pounds. I have to walk a mile from the flight line to the a headquarters of mine where I could check in and then go from there to my, to my final destination. It's two o'clock in the morning. I walk up a little tired, but I'm trusting God. I really am. I'm saying, Lord, you got a plan. I don't know what it is. This doesn't make any sense, but I'm gonna trust you. So no kidding, I walk up and there's the Sergeant Major who is the highest ranking enlisted individual in the unit, standing talking with a Lieutenant. And they look as if they have seen a ghost and I walk up and I'm all happy chappy, right? Hey guys, it's two o'clock in the morning, I'm back. They look at me and said, Chaplain, wow, we're glad you're here. And I said, well, what's going on? They said, we just had about eight casualties not too far from here. I said, well, what happened? Well, a gun, one of our artillery guns exploded. The blasting cap come loose on the backside, which killed two soldiers instantaneously and injured four. The commander of my organization did not know that was going to happen. It happened about 30 minutes prior to me walking up. You can't plan that. Think about all that stuff, all that chaos of traveling and getting here to there. I could have never planned that timing. My commander didn't have a clue that was going to happen. As a matter of fact, he wished it wouldn't have happened because that causes a lot of hard work on his part and it does a lot to the morale at the end of a deployment. So I was there at the right place, at the right time, unbeknownst to me, was able to conduct ministry to the casualties that were alive at the hospital that were just 50 meters away from where I had to turn in. 
And then I was also there to help and assist with the memorial. Otherwise, I would have been far away and wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been back for that. So you think, how can we do all this? Well, we can do it because we know God's in control. We know that if, as we stand and, and stand our post as soldiers for Christ, and we just hold on in there, that He is going to make a way. And He's going to provide. And because it's hard, because it will be hard, you will have these experiences where it doesn't make sense in your life. But we have to trust the Lord. It's real. It's powerful. And God will encourage you like He's encouraged me. He will continue to encourage you like He already has, like He is now, and like He will continue to be because He's the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He does not change. And so then when I read in my devotions things like Charles Spurgeon in one of his sermons titled Christ Crucified, listen to this, why we do what we do. He says this, he says, the gospel to the Christian is a thing of power. We're soldiers for the gospel, right? He says, what is it that makes the young man devote himself as a missionary to the cause of God, to leave father and mother and go into distant lands? It is a thing of power. It's a thing of power that does it. It is the gospel. What is it that constrains yonder minister in the midst of cholera? to climb up that creaking staircase and stand by the bed of some dying creature who has that dire disease. It must be a thing of power which leads him to venture his life. It is love of the cross of Christ which bids him to do it. What is that which enables one man to stand up before a multitude of his fellows, all unprepared it may be, but determined that he will speak nothing but Christ and him crucified? What is it that enables him to cry like the war horse of Job in battle and move glorious in might? It is a thing of power that does it. It is Christ crucified. And what emboldens that timid female to walk down that dark lane some wet evening that she may go and sit beside the victim of a contagious fever? What strengthens her to go through that den of thieves and pass by the profligate, and the profane? What influences her to enter into that charnel house of death and there sit down and whisper words of comfort? Does gold make her do it? They are too poor to give her gold. Does fame make her do it? She shall never be known nor written among the mighty women of this earth. What makes her do it? It is love of merit? No. She knows she has no desert before high heaven. What impels her to do it? It is the power, the thing of power. It is the cross of Christ. She loves it. And she therefore says a hymn quoted by Charles Spurgeon, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, love so divine. Demands my soul, my life, and my all. In closing, I want to share another verse with you. It's Psalm 102. Serve the Lord with gladness. Joy, gladness is the thing that we must take in, into consideration as we serve the Lord with joy and gladness. I want to share that with you. You see, a soldier is honored to serve his or her country with gladness. That's the mindset. Christians must serve God with joy, for our fruit is eternal. A certainty of that fruit will no doubt give us unmeasurable joy to serve. Our joy is the oil that lubricates our hard grinding and commitment in this life, despite the hardness of the task that is our calling. Charles Spurgeon said again, and I quote, Joy is the grease on the axle as it gets hot. Final thought. Hear this. You see, soldiers, we, military, all military personnel of this world, we make a commitment to sacrifice our lives and spill our blood, maybe even on foreign soil. Potentially, 
Now listen to this. We sacrifice, spill our blood on foreign soil, potentially to finance freedom. But the Christian soldier must be committed to the sacrifice of their life in order to proclaim the blood of Christ, that which was spilled. And it is more than a finance payment, but it's a full payment of eternal life. Let us remember that the payment of Christ pays in full the debt of sin, pays outright for the freedom that is eternal. Soldiers for Christ, proclaiming the sacrifice of the full payment.